This short video will give you a summary of the main characters that feature in J.B. Priestley's masterpiece, An Inspector Calls. Priestley introduces most of the characters through the opening stage directions of the play. Remember that stage directions are basically instructions from the writer to the actors, designers, director and anyone else involved. The opening stage directions in An Inspector Calls give us a good insight into how Priestley intends each character to be portrayed by the actors and also viewed by the audience. Let's take a look at the stage directions which describe the characters. At Rise of Curtain, the four Burlings and Gerald are seated at the table with Arthur Burling at one end, his wife at the other, Eric downstage and Sheila and Gerald seated upstage. Edna, the parlour maid, is just clearing the table which has no cloth, of dessert plates and champagne glasses, etc., and replacing them with a decanter of port, cigar box and cigarettes. Port glasses are already on the table. All five are in the evening dress of the period, the men in tails and white ties, not dinner jackets. Arthur Burling is a heavy-looking, rather potentous-looking man in his middle fifties, but rather provincial in his speech. His wife is about 50, a rather cold woman, and her husband's social superior. Sheila is a pretty girl in her early 20s, very pleased with life and rather excited. Gerald Croft is an attractive chap, about 30, rather too manly to be a dandy, but very much the easy, well-bred man about town. Eric is in his early 20s, not quite at ease, half shy, half assertive. At the moment, they have all had a good dinner, are celebrating a special occasion, and are pleased with themselves. Some crucial things to note about the group as a whole can be found in the early part of the stage directions. The Burling family are entertaining a guest for dinner, Gerald Croft, and husband and wife, Arthur and Sybil Burling, are seated at either end of the table, indicating the formal nature of the dinner. Priestley then hints at the Burling's wealth and status in society, by indicating props such as champagne glasses and dessert plates being cleared away by another character, Edna, the maid. In Edwardian society, it was typical for middle-class households to have help with housekeeping, so the presence of Edna is an important clue of the Burling's status as a wealthy, middle-class family of some means. This is further emphasised by the evening wear the characters are all wearing, and the decanter of port on the table, which serves as a symbol and visual reminder that the Burlings enjoy much wealth and privilege. The first character to be introduced is Arthur Burling, the father and head of the household. Remember, Edwardian society was patriarchal, which means that men had more power than women. So Arthur's character, as the oldest man, would see himself as being able to dictate the proceedings to a certain degree. Priestley describes Arthur as a heavy-looking, rather potentous-looking man in his middle fifties, but rather provincial in his speech. He is a little overweight, which is again a nod to his wealth and comfortable state of living, and portentous, an adjective which means self-important or full of himself, suggests that Arthur carries himself with a need to impress others. Additionally, Priestley notes he is provincial in his speech, which means he has a recognisable local accent. This is an important detail, as it indicates Arthur has not been born into money and perhaps lacks the manners and speech which would be expected of those in upper-class society. The next character to be introduced is Sybil Burling, Arthur's wife. She is described as about 50, a rather cold woman, and her husband's social superior. The adjective cold suggests that Sybil can be unkind or aloof, but more notably the theme of class is highlighted as she is socially superior to Arthur. This would mean that Sybil was born into a wealthy, upper-class family, and as a result would have perhaps a higher opinion of her own position in society. This societal superiority would grant her a certain power over Arthur in society. 
Next up is Sheila Burling, Arthur and Sybil's daughter. Priestley introduces Sheila as a pretty girl in her early 20s, very pleased with life and rather excited. Because Sheila is unmarried, as a woman, she would still be living at home under the guardianship of her parents until at least she gets married. Considering this, Priestley suggests her innocence and naivety in the phrase pleased with life and the adjective excited, perhaps a stereotypical view of wealthy young women of the time. The last of the Burlings is Eric, Sheila's brother, who is also in his 20s and described using an oxymoron, half shy, half assertive. Assertive means confident or forceful, so Eric is presented as wanting to be taken seriously, but perhaps lacking the conviction in his opinions as a young man. Priestley hints at an inner conflict within Eric in the phrase, not quite at ease, which indicates he may have something to hide. Gerald Croft, who will shortly be engaged to Sheila, is identified as an attractive chap about 30, rather too manly to be a dandy, but very much the easy, well-bred man about town. This description presents Gerald as a confident man, who is attractive, but not overly obsessed with fashion or his appearance. His family are later identified by Arthur as Sir George and Lady Croft, whose titles mark them out as upper class, and in Lady Croft's case, part of the aristocracy or nobility, a group whose titles and land have been passed down for generations. Gerald is therefore described as easy and well-bred, which suggests that his upper-class social position is superior to Arthur's, despite his younger years. The parlourmaid, Edna, is briefly mentioned in the stage directions, but is given very few lines in the play at all. However, her regular appearances on stage serve to remind the audience of the Burling's privilege and status in society. She is a symbol within the play of the unheard working classes, and no doubt included intentionally to reinforce J.B. Priestley's sympathetic view of the working classes. The two remaining characters are introduced later on in the first act, the inspector and Eva Smith or Daisy Renton. Let's take a look at Priestley's stage directions for the inspector, who is introduced halfway through Act 1. The inspector need not be a big man, but he creates at once an impression of massiveness, solidity and purposefulness. He is a man in his fifties, dressed in a plain darkish suit of the period. He speaks carefully, weightily, and has a disconcerting habit of looking hard at the person he addresses before actually speaking. Notably, Priestley spends a larger word count on the inspector's stage directions, which imply his eagerness to have the inspector portrayed in a certain way. From the outset, the character is designed to be taken seriously. The nouns massiveness, solidity and purposefulness have connotations of strength and confidence. But this is not conveyed by his costume, a plain darkish suit, but rather by his style of speaking, which Priestley instructs should be careful and weighty. The inspector is characterised as a calm and assertive character who does not waste his words. Finally, the character if Eva Smith never actually appears on the stage. She is introduced by the inspector in a dramatic and shocking fashion as he announces he is looking for information about her due to her recent suicide. The inspector comments, She'd swallowed a lot of strong disinfectant. Burned her inside out, of course. We soon learn that Eva is a former employee of Burling's factory who helped to organise a strike for higher wages. From this we can infer she is a confident and strong-willed woman. Of course, later in the play, Priestley reveals much more of her character through her connections to the other Burlings and Gerald Croft. Thanks for watching this short analysis of the characters in an Inspector Calls. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you found this content helpful.